see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder that pound throughout the universe display. Then sings my song. Clear 
Hallelujah, God above. Hallelujah, God above it all. Hallelujah, God unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. And faithful and great God. Amen. by the 
Um, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. Um, I'm so excited to be preaching in Luke chapter 6. And as you're turning in your Bibles to Luke chapter 6, we're going to celebrate the baptisms that we celebrated last week. Uh, Maybe you weren't here and didn't get to witness those, and we just want you to get to celebrate with those people that were making their faith public by being baptized. Maybe, uh, Maybe you need to be baptized, and maybe watching these will stir in your heart that you're ready for that step. So uh, watch on the screen as we celebrate these baptisms. Baptism is a step of obedience after we've trusted in the Lord and received Him as our Lord and Savior. He came for all humanity Exchanged His crown for suffering Became the Lamb, the offering Buried in humility He left our sin there in the ground born in Portland, Oregon, and Elizabeth Elliott was born in Belgium, and they met on the campus of Wheaton College right around the late 1940s, early 1950s. And a romance struck up between the two of them and their passion for the Lord, and in particular, their passion to reach the nations. And with a laser-like focus, God burdens their heart for Ecuador. So they go and they serve in some short-term missionary assignments. And as they're serving in short-term missionary assignments, the Lord just seals in their heart that God was calling them to give their lives, to take the gospel to the Quechua people in Quitor, Ecuador. The people group were the Aucas is the ones that they began to engage. In 1953, Jim and Elizabeth were married in Ecuador and began to give their lives along with four other missionary couples to reach these people. Not only had the gospel not successfully and effectively reached this people group, people outside of that tribe had never successfully gone into that tribe and lived. Every outside people that tried to engage relationally with this tribe had been killed. So you're kind of thinking, sign me out, right? Like, no thank you. I think I'll leave that for someone else. Well, these five bold, brave missionary couples walked in obedience to the Lord and said, we're going to take the gospel into a hard place where people have never survived because God loves these people. And so they took, uh, they began, the men began to engage this, this, uh, this tribe, the Aucas, and, uh, and they were speared to death speared to death. And you can only imagine the way the wives of these men must have felt. And you can kind of begin to just kind of almost even parse through in your own mind and heart how you might have thought and felt in response to what happened. You, you, I think many of us probably would have shaken our fist in the face of God and said, God, how dare you? We gave our whole lives for you. We did exactly what you wanted us to do. We moved out of everything that was comfortable and we went into a foreign land and we risked our lives for your sake and you let them be murdered. That's the way many of us would respond. But that's not the way the women responded. It's amazing because Elizabeth Elliot went back to these people, she remained with her 10-month-old daughter. And she found just a a neighboring tribe. Some women befriended her. She learned the language and then went into the Aka people and shared with them in their language who she was and who her husband was and what they had done and shared the gospel with them. And many in that tribe came to know Jesus and there's a vibrant 
there is a, a vibrant pocket of believers in Jesus in Quito, Ecuador today. Uh, this story, this amazing story, it's documented in, there's movies, the tip of the spear, there's books that Elizabeth wrote. The story, Elizabeth Elliot became a prolific writer. Uh, years later, she moved back to the States and wrote nearly 20-something books. But, but here's what the, the wives who lost their husbands, here's the prayer they wrote. Listen to this. Our hearts are filled with gratitude for the privilege he gave us in being the wives of men who were chosen to be slain for his sake. None of us is worthy. It is all his grace. But we know that the lamb is worthy a thousand times the lives of our husbands and of us. He chose to glorify himself in their death. May he now glorify himself in our lives. And if that wasn't enough, their prayer for themselves, here's their prayer for their children. Listen to this. Not only do we ask that Christ be glorified in the Aukas, those people that killed their husbands, and in us, but also in our children. Most of them will have no recollection of their fine fathers. But the Lord gave his word. All they children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of they children. We ask for his wisdom in training them, for his spirit in us, that they may be uh, as obedient as their fathers. How wonderful would it be, listen to this, how wonderful would it be if he should prepare one or more of them to go to the Aukas? Do you, do you hear what these women are praying? God, it would be wonderful if you raise up our children to go as missionaries to the tribe that killed their fathers. We would give them to him for his use, asking that they come to know him as Savior and Lord at an early age. Far be it from us to withhold from the Lord the lives of these little ones, children of the men who did not withhold their own lives. May they sing from true hearts, faith of our fathers, holy faith, we would be true to thee till death. The title of this morning's sermon is Loving Those Hardest to Love. <laughs> and I just think the very tribe that they went to reach had to be for those women and for Elizabeth Elliot the hardest people on the planet to love, for they murdered her husband and their husbands. And yet they remained and prayed for these people and prayed, God, use our children. And God honored their love for these people. It may sound crazy to you. It may sound ridiculous. It may sound reckless. It may sound radical. But to Jesus, it sounds normal. It sounds normal. And we see this in Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 27. I want you to see it. Grab your Bible. Pick up in verse 27. And listen to the King of Kings. But I say to you who hear. I'll just pause there. What Jesus is assuming is that he's about to speak and people are going to hear him with their physical ears but not with their spiritual hearts. They're not going to be able to receive what Jesus has to say. And some of us here this morning, we will hear this and we will flat out reject this. But I'm praying by the power of the Spirit that many of us will have ears to hear this this morning. And this is what Jesus says, love your enemies. I'll just pause there. Who is your enemy? Who, who, is, who is your enemy? Do you have a name? Do you have a face coming up? Do you have, do you have 10 faces coming up? Jesus says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. 
And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Anybody feel the need just to pray right now <laughs> and say, God, help us? Let's do that. Father, help us. Oh, God, shift something deep in our hearts today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's be honest. Sometimes our enemies our enemies, not because we've lived a godly life, but because we've lived an ungodly life, right? So Jesus, in the paragraph before this, Jesus is talking about, you know, um, you're blessed when people persecute you on account of me. So, so Jesus is speaking about assuming that if we faithfully follow Jesus, people that love the darkness are not going to love the light. So they're not going to love us. They're gonna, they, they love the darkness, so when we shine the light of Christ, they hate that right? That's what Jesus is assuming. But let's just be honest, many of us have enemies, not because shining light, but because of how annoying we've been, or how hateful, hateful we've been, or how rude we've been, or how, right? I mean, like, so, so we're not so much talking about all those people that we've made our enemies, but people that have chosen to be our enemies. And if we we're really just having a conversation, most of us would say this morning, look, I, like I would never use the term enemy to describe anybody, right? Like, like I might despise them. <laughs> and somehow that phraseology like feels a little better in our mind, you know. I don't like them. To be in the same room with them just crawls up all over my skin, but they're not my enemy, <laughs> right? Well, Jesus says for those people, that you despise, for those people that you, you, you cannot stand, love them, pray for them, bless, bless them. Um, that boss that fired you, that boss that gave the promotion to someone else, your ex-husband or your ex-wife, who was unfaithful, or who won't pay child support, or who just won't grow up. Your competitor who has cheated to get ahead and engaged in unethical practices. Your parent who was absent in your life or who left your mom or left your dad. Your current spouse who seems to be absent emotionally. Maybe they're absent with the kids. Maybe they've become a workaholic. Maybe they've grown cold or distant to you. Maybe that spouse that loses their temper. Jesus says, love them. Pray for them. Your business partner who lied to you, or stole from you, or stabbed you in the back, didn't follow through on what he or she said they would do. Jesus says, love them. Pray for them. Jesus is giving us a, a whole new way of living, isn't he? Jesus is, Jesus is inviting us into a a completely different way to live than that is, that is natural. This is super natural. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Amen. I love it. How about your best friend who stole your girlfriend? Not really wanting to text them, are you? You might want to text some stuff about them to somebody else, but you're not really wanting to talk to them. How about... That kid at school, maybe you begged your parents to let you go virtual because you know there's those two kids at school that you don't want to be in a classroom with them because they bully you and they put you down and they make you feel like trash when you know God wants you to feel loved by him and God wants you to feel valued. And they just squash you to feel like nothing. Well, we have our typical ways to respond to our enemies, right? First, we hate them. Those people that hate us, we just hate them back, right? We, we typically, we respond, we just hate them. But, but some of us are a little more sophisticated than that, right? We just avoid them, right? right? How many times have you heard somebody say, you just need to ignore them? You just need to ignore them. 
the world says, ignore your enemies, and Jesus says, love them and pray for them. We, in our flesh, the most natural way to respond to enemies is we hate them, we ignore them, and we seek to injure them, right? Injure them. So sometimes it's intentional. We actually come up with a scheme on how we're going to injure them, take them out, cut their feet out from under them, spread gossip about them. But sometimes we don't even realize we're doing it, but it started with hating them, and it's just a natural overflow of hating them in our heart that we injure them because that's what flows out of a, a heart filled with hatred. And the simple truth is we just cannot pick and choose the scriptures that we want to believe and obey. But this is the way that Jesus invites us into. This, this past week as I was looking at this text, the Holy Spirit brought three men to my mind. And they were just kind of like over the last 15 years, one in each season of life that hurt me. And I haven't prayed for these men personally since kind of all that went down, so to speak. And I got on my knees in my office and I just prayed for them by name. And can I tell you, there wasn't like the, the, the heavens didn't open up and like the spirit fall and like this euphoria kind of experience. That's not what I experienced. But I did experience a little bit of a, a lightning. I, I did experience a, a real um, soft, subtle, quiet peace. And it was as if the Holy Spirit was saying to me, that's right. That's right, and that's what you need to do tomorrow, and that's what you need, need to do the next day. That's right, that's right, and I felt a little lighter. Listen, King Jesus went to the cross, and he bore our sins on the cross, and he rose victoriously over the grave, not only to free us from the punishment of our sin, but to free us from the burden of hatred to free us from having to carry around the burden of a bitter heart. Jesus went to the cross so that you wouldn't have to carry that. And he's promised to bring about vengeance. God is a just God. And you think, how can I love my enemies? How can I not hate them? They don't deserve my love. That's the whole point of grace, right? Is that it's undeserved. But here's what you can, the Lord says, vengeance is mine. So you can let go of it and you can pray for your enemies, and you can leave it in the hands of the Lord, and you can trust that he's going to take care of it far more perfectly than we would have. And you free yourself from the burden of bitterness and hatred. Do you see it, friends? Listen, King Jesus loves you, and he does not want you to bear that burden. That's why Jesus says, love your enemies. Don't demonize them and seek revenge and seek to injure them. And there's a better way, Jesus said. There's a better way. Way. This text is so helpful during an election year, right? <laughs> it's like the temperature. It's not, you know, it's like what it may be like on a four right now, but it's like it's like every couple of weeks. It's just turning up, not five, six, seven, you know. And before we know it, it's going to be like full-blown ten. And there's going to be all these, all these Christian people spewing venom on the Internet, because we've somehow gotten it twisted in our mind that we think some politician is going to usher in the kingdom of God. And only Jesus, the king of kings, will bring his kingdom. So look, it's good for us to have well thought out, intellectual, passionate positions, political positions. And it's good and it's right for us to have deep convictions about who we're going to vote for and to advocate for that. But it's not okay for us to demonize people that have been created in the image of the infinitely valuable God. It's just not okay. It's just, it's not the way of Jesus. It's the way of the world. It's the way of the flesh. And Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds, that they glorify your Father in heaven. Listen, I mean, I've got wants for our country, just like you do. Like I've, got, I've got passions, and I've got desires, and I'm praying for particular ends. But listen, I am not afraid if they don't come through. Why? Because my hope is not in this world. And neither is yours, friends. 
The Bible says that we're aliens and strangers. This world is not our home. Our world is the city to come, and only King Jesus will bring that. So we don't have to freak out what happens this election year, and you don't have to demonize somebody that holds a different position than you do, and you don't have to have all the answers, friends, but what you do have to do is love your enemies. So here's the question you need to write down this morning, punch into your phone. you got to get this. Here's the question, that in this election season, does the tone of my communication convey love? Does the tone of my communication convey love? I was, I was reading the other day. I, I heard a really, really wise man. It's, sorry, just backing up a couple of layers. It's very easy to reminisce in the good old days, right? <laughs> and so like every generation is tempted to look backwards and think that um, to only remember the good old days and to forget the bad, right? So we look back and we reminisce about, about the good old days. But a few years ago, I was listening to a man that I really respected who's lived a lot longer than I have. He's been alive a lot longer than I have. And he said, what I'm seeing today is our country is far more polarized than it ever has been. And I listened to what he was saying. And I was reading an article the other day that basically talked about the way the, way the media has like electrified our emotions. In other words, years ago, the media was more print than it was video. And so we would sit down and we would read the news and we would read articles and we would actually read like paper newspapers. I know, teenagers, can you imagine? They were big, they were like this big and you'd hold it like this. I know, I know, you guys are awesome. And we're like, no, oh, we're gonna, yeah, we gotta hold our newspaper here, right? That's the way we read the news. But now like the way, the way we get news are these like 30 second, over the top, emotional, emotionally charged sound bites. And what that does to us as we're just devouring it is it, we, we drink that and then we anchor in emotionally with those emotionally charged sound bites and our whole country just starts polarizing because we're not thoughtfully engaging reading the news. We're being emotionally stirred by, by emotionally charged sound bites. without even realizing it's happening to us. And so Jesus' invitation to us is kind of like, hey, wake up. You, you don't have to be that way. And he contrasts it all through this text, doesn't he? He says, if you love those that love you, sinners do that. If you lend to those that are going to pay it back, sinners do that, right? He's saying, he's saying you're saints, you're not sinners. Right? You're, the, you're the children of God, you're not the children of the world, right? That Jesus says, no, you've got a whole new identity if you're my follower. You've got a whole new value system. You've got a whole new way of thinking about the world. And listen, during this election year, let's let that be seen by the tone of our communication. Advocate, but do it in a way that conveys love. There's a couple of, couple of motivations that Jesus gives us in this text. And the first motivation is loving our enemies gains us great reward. In other words, listen, in other words, Jesus is not, <laughs> Jesus is so good, you guys. Jesus is so good. Jesus is not saying, love your enemies so that you're just good moral people. No, look at what Jesus said. Verse Verse 35, Jesus says, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. It'll be great. Have you ever gotten an end of the year bonus, you know, that you just thought wasn't going to be that great? You know, it's like images of like Christmas vacation are coming up in all of our minds, right? You know, like... Sorry, I, I cannot recommend that movie, okay? I cannot recommend it. I'm confessing. I, I don't know. Anyways, the TV version's always better, right? You know, it's like you watch the uncut version, you're like, how did our parents ever let us watch this movie? Sorry, if you don't know, you don't know, and it's okay. That one did not land. 
Have you ever gotten a Christmas bonus and you gave your tithe and you took out your taxes and then you felt, well, that's not really much of a bonus, is it? Some of you are like, I'd like a, any kind of bonus, right? Hey, listen, Jesus is saying, listen, an end of your life bonus is coming. And it is, and it is great if you'll love your enemies, if you'll pray for them, if you'll pray. Don't injure them, don't ignore them, don't hate them, love them, pray for them. You're, so your reward will be great. Jesus is saying, look toward the reward and let it motivate you. In other words, it's going to be really, really, really good for you if you'll do this what Jesus is saying. If you love your enemies, it's going to be really, 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 really good for you. And and then lastly, he says, we we see loving our enemies reflects God's mercy. And that's why he says, look at verse 35, that's why he says, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. What Jesus is not saying, look, what Jesus is not saying is, you earn your salvation and you earn your salvation by loving your enemies. That's not what Jesus is saying. Salvation is a gift. It's given by Jesus. It's a gift of grace. We can never earn it. We don't deserve it. You just receive it by faith, right? But what he is saying, it's like this. When, when you love your enemies, you look just like your father. <laughs> Have you ever seen somebody running around like everybody says, my Parker, Jack calls Parker Freddie T the third. My little mini me. He looks just like his dad, right? You've got those people in your family, you know? I mean, some of you really wish you didn't look just like your mom, but you do, right? And that's just the way it works. But here's what he's saying is, is when you love your enemies, you look just like your father in heaven. You look just like him. Why? Look at the next phrase. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Who is God kind to? the ungrateful, and the evil? Who does God lavish his love upon? Those that don't deserve it. They deserve judgment. They deserve separation. They deserve condemnation. And he gives them mercy and grace and love. And when we understand it right, we raise our hand and we say, I'm the evil one that God has loved with his grace and his mercy undeserved, but it's an unending waterfall of blessing and love. Amen. Look at verse 36. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. So we reflect God when we love our enemies because God looked at us, his enemies, and he sent his own son, Jesus, as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sins, rise from the dead, to conquer it all, to remove our guilt and shame. This is the good news of the gospel that saves us. Back in 2006, raise your hand if you weren't born in 2006. Raise it high, raise it high. If you were not born in 2006, raise your hand, keep it up. 2006, raise it up high. I just wanted to make everybody else feel old in the room. Thank you. In September of 2006, a a gunman entered an Amish schoolhouse in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And he killed five people and he injured five others, and then he killed himself. And the way the Amish community responded surprised a lot of people. They forgave the shooter. And then they began to care for the shooter's family. Let me just read some sections from a couple of articles. On the day of the shooting, a grandfather of one of the murdered Amish girls was heard warning some young relatives not to hate the killer, saying, we must not think evil of this man. Another Amish father noted, he had a mother and a wife and a soul, and now he's standing before a just God. The killer's last name was Roberts, and a Roberts family spokesperson said that an Amish neighbor comforted the Roberts the the, the Roberts family hours after the shooting and extended forgiveness to them. The the day of the shooting, they extended forgiveness and comforted the family of the gunman. The Amish community members visited and comforted Robert's uh, widow and his parents and his parents-in-law. Listen to this. One Amish man held Robert's father, the gunman's father, 
in his arms, reportedly for as long as an hour while he sobbed. Such a beautiful picture of embracing our enemies with love. That week, the Roberts had a private funeral for their son, the one that killed himself and killed the five others and injured the other five. But as they went to the gravesite, they saw as many as 40 Amish coming out from around the side of the graveyard, surrounding them like a crescent. The Amish have also set up a charitable fund for the family of the shooter. Marie Roberts wrote an open letter to her Amish neighbors thanking them for their forgiveness and grace and mercy. She wrote, your love for our family has helped to provide the healing we so desperately need. Gifts, you, gifts you've given have touched our hearts in a way no words can describe. Your compassion has reached beyond our family, beyond our community, and is changing our world. And for this, we sincerely thank you. And then listen to these last two quotes. I will never forget the devastation caused by my son, says the 65-year-old Terry. But one of the fathers, the other night, he said, none of us would have ever chosen this, but the relationships we have built through it, you can't put a price on. And then this is what she said. And their choice to allow life to move forward was quite a healing balm for us. And I think it's a message the world needs to hear. Right on. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we just confess our brokenness to you this morning and our weakness to you this morning, O oh Lord. Father, we just confess, Lord, that we, we just have so much flesh, Lord, so much sinful ways in us, Lord. And Father, we pray that you would touch us today with your grace, Lord, that you would empower us by your spirit to not live the natural way, but to live the supernatural Jesus way. Father, we confess to you this morning that we have hated and we have hated and we have hated and we have demonized and we have demonized, we have demonized. And so many of us this morning, we have hard, bitter hearts and we thank you, King Jesus, that you can just take away our hard heart and restore it with your spirit and empower us to actually love and pray for those that have hurt us so deeply. Or maybe that we just feel like we just despise who they are. Lord, have mercy on us and empower us to walk a brand new way. Empower us, Lord, by your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Saints, let's stand to our feet. Let's sing to our God. And I, you take away my sin. Then sings my